What Sean failed to mention in the introduction was that we used to work together a very long time ago, about 15 years ago, at the Royal Free Hospital in London. Uh, and Sean back then uh, worked for a consultant called Norrie Graham, who some of you may know. And I was just thinking about it in the, in this morning, that when we were talking about dementia 15, 20 years ago, and Norrie had a pivotal role in, in, in leading on some of those conversations, um, conversations which are still happening now, we had a certain way of conceptualizing or understanding dementia. And obviously with the progress of science and a greater understanding of the diseases that lead to dementia, uh, I think within EPAD we believe this is an opportunity for not, a, not an alternate conversation but an additional conversation regarding what it actually means to have Alzheimer's disease in the years and even decades before Alzheimer's uh, dementia. And, an EPAD is exclusively looking to prevent dementia. So therefore, the people we're talking to, be they the scientists, the public, the companies, uh, we're talking exclusively about preclinical or prodromal dementia. So we have a particular role within Work Package 8 and Work Package 6 of EPAD to really maybe uh, frame those conversations and those discussions, and that's what this uh, symposium is about today. So I've only got about 15 slides or so. I wanted to keep the, the, the slides to a minimum to give us plenty of opportunity for, for discussion uh, because it's not really for, for me or for us to tell you what we think are the answers to these things. This is just a sort of an opening sort of statement, if you like, in a conversation which will take place uh, between many, many, many parties over the coming years. But I think one of the first things to do is I still get asked by my mother, and I've been working this area for 20 years, what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's dementia? And I say, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. But obviously, I'm not getting through. So I think we need to be, be communicating a little bit better. If I can't convince my mother what the difference is, then we've got, we've got a slight problem. So I want to sort of take us back a little bit, some definitions, if you like, of what is disease in a, in a medical or a clinical sense, and a little bit about what is dementia. I then think it's important to put together some biological or clinical anchoring points uh, for uh, this distinction, or, this, or, these, or these, these, these different areas within a continuum. And then finally, I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully argue that there needs to be this what I call paradigm shift in terms of how we understand Alzheimer's disease uh, and how we, how we move forward. So if you go to the dictionary um, and you ask you know, Google what the definition of disease is, just in the general sense, then there's some key phrases that come up. Um, in the Oxford English Dictionary, for instance, it talks about a disorder of structure or function in a human, animal, or plant uh, that produces specific symptoms. So that's an interesting uh, definition already because, of course, in, Alts in, in, in EPAD, we'll be uh, working with people who are asymptomatic um, or that affects a specific location, so in our case, the brain. The Collins Dictionary, however, is a little bit more inclusive. It says any impairment of normal physiological functioning but again, it emphasizes the production of symptoms. So again, this is maybe one of the issues that we, we, we have a, a problem with, is that traditionally disease has been conceptualized as causing symptoms. But in the preclinical stages of disease, almost by definition, people don't have symptoms. And finally, the Merriam-Webster dictionary says, an illness that affects a person, animal, or plant, a condition that prevents the body or mind from working normally. Now, I like that one because it doesn't talk about symptoms, okay? So in, in essence, what you could argue is that there's a possibility to have a disease before the symptoms develop. And I think that's really important because what we believe, and what I'll go on to explain in a little bit more detail later, is that you can have the disease processes that lead to Alzheimer's dementia in your brain 20, 30, 40 years before dementia develops. So Alzheimer's disease could be a disease of midlife that expresses itself in one way as Alzheimer's dementia in later life. And what this slide is trying to, to highlight is this almost continuum, if you like, from left to right, of Alzheimer's disease pathology in the brain that starts off with what we're calling preclinical, that moves not through boundaries, but in this sort of spectrum, if you like, from preclinical to prodromal to dementia. And over that continuum from left to right, you're having to, to, to make these diagnoses or make these assessments at the early stages, at the preclinical stages, essentially on brain disease, on biomarkers, what's in the brain, what's going wrong. 
But as time goes by and the disease progresses, you then rely more heavily on cognitive or other functional measures. And there's a trade-off in the middle. So at the stage of prodromal dementia, we have biomarker assessments thrown into the diagnostic criteria as well as cognitive symptoms. But as we go back in time and we look at early in the disease, we may exclusively be making a diagnosis on the basis of biomarkers. And that's a huge conceptual distinction from where we are now. Because right back to when Sean and I were working together 15 years ago, the diagnosis of dementia has not changed very much. Because the diagnosis of dementia exclusively relies on what you see by talking to a patient or their carer or and their carer and what you observe. There is no biological test for Alzheimer's dementia, which when you're talking about Alzheimer's disease, you're talking about preclinical and prodromal, you think, well, hang on, this is an incredibly um, you know, challenging or damaging brain disease, yet in medicine, we don't use any of that brain disease to define the diagnosis. What you have for a diagnosis of dementia is memory impairment. So there's a priority of memory impairment in the diagnostic criteria, be ICT-10 or DSM-4. The disease itself causes another uh, cognitive domain to be affected. It could be planning, language, judgment, etc. And then there's a loose definition that has an impact on function. And we saw slides yesterday about the diagnostic rates in Denmark where at the, early, at the late stages of diseases, there was a, a, an accordance of about 85%, but in the early stages of dementia, it was only about 33%. Because this is not a very, in some ways, you could argue, it's not a very useful definition of brain disease. That's why I challenge us going forward, does, does dementia really exist? Because it's just a definition, if you like, doctors have created to define a clinical syndrome without any reference to what's actually happening in the brain. The other important thing is that any individual's presentation or their collection of symptoms is actually the manifestation not of just amyloid beta or tau uh, aggregating, but actually multiple interacting disease processes. And we're beginning to learn that more and more from our cohort studies and from our basic science research. So if you look at um, Alzheimer's disease specifically, you're talking about two principal lesions. You're talking about the hyperphosphorylation of tau, I don't know if I've got a point pointer, but the hyperphosphorylation of tau, which causes the microtubule to break down, and that obviously isn't good for the cell. And then you have the aggregation of amyloid beta to form the amyloid plaque. And all of our biomarkers, all of our assessments uh, that we're currently developing are looking at changes in CSF A beta, spinal fluid A beta level, CSF tau levels, and now we've got PET imaging, which can also capture uh, the aggregation of A beta and also the hyperphosphorylation of tau. That's Alzheimer's disease, and that might be happening very early on in the piece in, say, a 50-year-old or 55-year-old is beginning to, 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 to have problems. However, if you were to look at the brain, as, as we do in post-mortems, but also with biomarkers, of somebody with Alzheimer's dementia, then you don't just see the problems with the A-beta and tau, though they may predominate. You see multiple other interacting pathological processes. You may see cerebrovascular changes. You may see changes in alpha-synuclein, which is a protein which aggregates more specifically in Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. You may see a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. You may see activation of glial cells, lactate stress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things may contribute to the person's presentation with dementia. So sticking that together in a cartoon, um, if you can imagine down the left-hand panel, those are different pathological processes. They're not distinct. They're not distinct processes from each other. That's why I've tried to draw this. They all can kind of merge into one gestalt, if you like, of neuropathology. A beta metabolism, problems with cortisol. We know about challenges with the HPA, ex HPA axis and stress, inflammation, vascular changes, tau, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, uh, alpha synuclein, and just the aging process itself. So somebody who's normally aging, if we were to be able to look at the biomarkers, look at the brain from the age of 40 onwards to 90, this might be the kind of profile you see. However, if you looked at somebody with Alzheimer's dementia, the profile would be different. So what you'd see there is possibly, and this is all hypothetical, more A-beta pathology, more mitochondrial dysfunction, more vascular pathology. And one of the reasons I think we've been frustrated over recent years of being able to develop drugs to affect the disease course 
in Alzheimer's disease is we've been trialing those drugs in people with Alzheimer's dementia. Okay? When we trial those specific anti-amyloid drugs in people with Alzheimer's dementia, you knock down potentially one pathology. But you don't do anything else for all the other things that are driving that clinical presentation. So what EPAD is trying to do is say, well, hang on, how can we go upstream and actually identify the pathological changes that are taking place in people in their 50s and 60s with preclinical or early prodromal Alzheimer's dementia? And by using either specific uh, therapies against one pathology or even better, still combina combinations of therapies, you could argue that if you knock down these pathologies early, then you may have a downstream benefit uh, in, in, the other, in the other pathologies as well. So just to illustrate this kind of one last time, if you like, in that 50-year-old where I'm going to say this, is got, this person's got Alzheimer's disease, the 30 years before they'd be likely to get dementia, you have much more specific pathology present in the brain, focused on A, beta, and tau. You will rely heavily on tests, biomarkers, to diagnose uh, the condition. These individuals, hopefully, will be asymptomatic. That's not to say they won't have cognitive impairment. In fact, we're designing, or we have designed, and we just recently published, on the cognitive evaluation that we'll be doing in EPAD to pick up these cognitive impairments. But these are not symptoms. These are not things that people are coming to a doctor and saying, hey, doc, my, my Four Mountains test isn't very good. I mean, the tests we're doing are very specific against particular areas of the brain we believe to be involved early, but very, very pre-symptomatic. And also the assumption is, and it's an assumption at this stage, is that the, the disease itself is more modifiable. Compare that with somebody with Alzheimer's dementia, where one would argue and one has seen obviously from post-mortem studies and even our biomarker assessments, multiple interacting pathologies are present. As it stands, biomarkers are not needed for diagnosis with the current criteria for dementia. You have very clearly a patient who's no longer asymptomatic but has substantial symptoms and functional decline. And it's in those populations where I think we have to try harder to develop better symptomatic treatments. Okay. Because the treatments we currently have, as we know, are good, but they're certainly not as good as they could be for managing symptoms. And people with dementia, and I don't just mean pharmacological, I also mean non-pharmacological interventions as well. So you can't go through a talk without showing the Clifford Jack slide. Um, but I think it's, just, it's, it's such a nice anchoring point for what we're talking about. So in EPAD, we're dedicated to secondary prevention. By that, we mean people who've got evidence of disease but don't have dementia. And what this is obviously illustrating, in a very simplistic way, and it's a very hypothetical series of curves, is this the problem with, with amyloid that precedes the problem with tau, that precedes the problem with the brain shrinking, the brain structure changing, uh, as we see through hippocampal atrophy and eventually more global atrophy, before symptoms develop, before functional decline. It's all very great in theory, but how are we going to actually move this from theory into practice? Well, number one, you, to do these studies, to do these disease modeling pieces of work, you need to find huge numbers of participants, tens of thousands of people, to give the highest quality data to be able to actually create the analytical the data set to do these analyses and actually see how these interactions are taking place and what the consequences of the diseases, disease processes truly are. Deep and accurate clinical phenotyping, we have to measure brain health through the cognitive evaluations I was talking about, but also neuropsychiatric symptoms, apathy, depression, etc. in this, in this uh, preclinical and prodromal population. That will help us to understand the biology that a little bit better. So obviously we'll get some scientific discovery in animal work and genetic work which might point to some biological processes we hadn't thought about previously. Um, we have to have the highest quality statisticians. I think we've got 14 statisticians in the EPAD family, all working incredibly hard at developing new disease models. And then ultimately we have to communicate these results to our scientific and public communities and patient communities. So a couple of projects, prevents one local in the UK but EPAD and AMIPAD are designed specifically to address those issues. So last couple of slides, Sean. Um, communication. Reason, risks, and benefits. I mean, I would argue that the, the reason to do this is we need to, we need to fundamentally change the way we conceptualize Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's dementia. We need to be able to be comfortable with the prospect that disease can precede dementia by many, many, many decades. 
as we embrace this potential for dementia prevention and the conversations we need to have are with the public, with patients, but also with scientists and clinicians, and also my mum, who still needs to understand these things. Because the scientists and clinicians are going down a route sometimes with their analyses and their studies, which actually is, is dare I say, old school. And I think we need to be able to do the right type of research across the board, not just within EPAD. The risks are, however, that all the graphs and slides I showed you, there wasn't a single p-value there. There was no data. It was hypothetical. So there's still a lot of uncertainty in the actual biology and end potential for change. And one could argue, is this all just at the research stage? rather than actually being ready for prime time into the, into the broader community. And we also are very familiar with the term dementia. We like it. You know, we're setting up a new institute, quarter of a billion pounds of investment in the UK around the Dementia Research Institute. So there's, it's going to be very hard to move away from using that term dementia, even though the Dementia Research Institute is dedicated to basic science. It's still using that term, dementia, uh, to, to, to bind the unit together. And like I say, done badly, this could obfuscate rather than clarify. But my penult penultimate slide. The benefits, this will be the future. There's no doubt. This is, what, this is what happens in medicine. You know, if you think about cancer, you think about cardiovascular disease, you think about any other branch of medicine, we get to this point where we recognize there's an asymptomatic preclinical phase, and that's where we have to put in, treat people with statins for their high cholesterol, treat people's blood pressure. Not because having high, high cholesterol levels does you any harm, only in so much as it gives you an increased chance of a stroke in later in life. Like I said, the reconceptualization will help framing of the research we're doing. So we're not doing old school research, we're doing modern, innovative research, thinking about what the future will be. And like I say, it aligns best with uh, other branches of medicine. So step one um, is to clarify the language, and we're doing this within Work Package 6 and Work Package 8 and EPAD, that helps everyone understand the distinction between AD and AD. It's a pity it's the same acronym, because they're used interchangeably without a real clear understanding of, of, of which it is. Step two, again, EPAD's doing this in, 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 in an incredibly you know, powerful way, is to bring empirical data to help inform these discussions. So it's not just hypothetical and opinion-based, it's very much empirically based. And if we are to do that, then ultimately we'll be able to target treatments at the earliest stages of disease for risk reduction to ultimately prevent dementia. So I'll stop there. I think it's been a minute over time, Sean. So thank you very much. Hi, Boris Azais from uh, MSD. Uh, j just, a, uh, just a few quick questions. So wh when, when you're talking about... Uh, <laughs> ah, I see. So uh, when you're talking about, um, uh, you know, prodromal, how, how, do, how, do you, how does it relate to time? Yeah, so I'll take those in reverse order. I mean, I think the prevention um, terminology is important. And I think, you know, we, we have had discussions with NEPAD about the distinction between primary and secondary prevention, because obviously epidemiologists and public health and clinicians and all that have different concepts. So we've rested on this, that this is where there's evidence of disease. And of course, you can argue, what does that mean? What's the disease process before dementia develops? Um, it's. It's, there is certainly a lot of work going on outside of EPAD of a primary prevention, okay, where maybe you don't have knowledge of the disease, uh, but you also are assuming that things you are doing about building resilience and cognitive reserve and childhood interventions, et cetera, may be primary prevention. The second part about, um, I mean, I, 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 I wonder about a future where we look at A beta levels, say in CSF or blood, like we currently look at cholesterol levels. It'll get to that stage. Because we treat cholesterol to stop stroke, because we know that it's a very good surrogate 
for your risk of, you know, and now we don't know that A beta in CSF in a 55 year old means anything. We just don't know. We haven't done the follow-up studies. But that's the paradigm that I think we're working towards is can you look at these biomarkers as good surrogates for future risk of decline towards dementia? So I think borrowing from other branches of medicine I think, I think is the easiest bit because they've all got there, that there are preclinical or prodromal phases of an illness characterized by disease changes, which if managed will prevent the stroke, or prevent the heart attack, et cetera. The first point about where do you do, what, how do you define preclinical and prodromal, I, I kind of hate doctors. I do. I really do. I am one. Um, well, I'm a psychiatrist. <laughs> Jury's out. It's out I'm, a, I'm a doctor. But we love putting people in buckets. You have preclinical. And then the next day, ah, you've reached another definition. You have prodromal. Now, everyone in this room knows, be they a clinician or a patient or anybody, that it doesn't work like that. People go slowly and gradually through spectrums and changes. So I'd like to almost get away from this concept of preclinical prodromal and dementia and actually just define people on the, on, the, on the degree and severity of the disease they have. You could call it mild, moderate, severe. You could call it type 1, type 2, type 3, like they do in oncology. You, know, you grade things. So I think I'd, I'd love to see the preclinical prodromal dementia language being abandoned completely. Because the problem is, exactly as you had defined it, articulated, where is the diagnosis of prodromal? What does that mean? I say it's meaningless, but at this stage. So 